Okay. Hi everyone. And uh, welcome to this reading slash commentary slash breakdown of chapter three of Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. The name of chapter three is The Suicide of Thought and it follows from previous chapters we've done. And in this reading, I'm basically gonna be going through the chapter very slowly, um, very systematically, trying to understand the ideas as we come across them. Um, there might be some areas where I'm still a bit fuzzy, but I'm gonna do my best to elaborate on the text as much as I possibly can. Uh, Chesterton is really a pleasure to read. He's very interesting and his idea, ideas just hit you so quickly as you're reading that you might read one sentence and if you skip over it, you might have missed like three ideas. So I'm going to try my best to, how should I say, cover the work adequately and do, uh, give due respect to Chesterton when I do that. So I've got the book in front of me with a bunch of notes and there's a few points where Chesterton actually mentions someone or he names a person that he's referencing. And what I've done is I'll actually pull up images of those people as we're going through the text. And I'll also just tell you a little bit about them so that you understand the context uh, in which Chesterton was writing this. I've also pulled up some commentaries, which I'll refer to now and then when um, we read something. I've often found it's very helpful to have a commentary just to reflect upon and then we can basically just try and understand what Chesterton is saying as clearly as possible. That's really the goal. I have about an hour to do this this evening so there's a chance I might just make this part one and then continue in another video. I'd rather do that than rush the whole reading um, because I don't really do this just to create the episode or to get the whole chapter done. I'm really working through the chapter with you as uh, as we as we read it live. So I don't want to rush it, but we'll see how much we get through. And I see we've got a few viewers and it's it's really awesome that you're here. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is just something I want to check quickly. Uh, if you are watching and you have access to your keyboard, which you probably do, just send me a yes if you can hear me, if the audio is good. Uh, if there's any issues, just let me know. This is a uh, live stream that I haven't really done in a while. So I just want to check all systems are running. If you can hear me, just send me a yes in the chat or any messages appreciated. But no news is good news. So I'm just going to assume everything is working <laughs> and we're going to get started. So chapter three, the suicide of thought. Now, it's important to realize that the previous chapter in which we basically um, talked about the maniac. And in chapter two, Chesterton brings about the point that it's very important for human beings to have emo uh, imagination along with reason. If we abandon imagination and along with imagination, our sense of wonder, we actually end up in a situation where we're left with nothing but our reason. And there's a lot of problems that can come from this. Chesterton sort of touches upon them in, in chapter two, but in chapter three, he fleshes this out. I, he fleshes this idea out a lot more. So you'll see he's going to convey a few core ideas throughout the chapter. And what I've done is I've just sort of taken each idea and I'm going to give you the idea to begin and then I'm going to read and then I'll show you how he's slowly leading, leading us up to his main point for that part of the chapter. So the first idea that he really gets to is that the modern world is full of the old Christian values gone mad. Um, so he's going to show us why that is, why it is that the values have actually gone crazy. And he's also going to show you what that means practically. So let's start off just by reading and then we'll reflect. So Chesterton says the phrases of the street are not only forcible, but subtle for a figure of speech can often get into a crack too small for a definition. Phrases like put out or off color might have been coined by Mr. Henry James in an agony of verbal precision. And there is no more subtle truth than that of the everyday phrase about a man having his heart in the right place. Okay, so 
this initial point, having your heart in the right place, Chesterton is basically going to use this phrase to express this first idea. So he kind of describes what his heart in the right place means in the next few lines. He says, it involves the idea of normal proportion. It's a normal idea. Not only does a certain function exist, but it is rightly related to other functions. So not only does the heart exist, but it's it's related to other functions. So you can think of heart as love. So love is intricately related to other things. So let's say it's related to truth. Uh, it's related to pity. So you have the v one virtue is intertangled or it's, it's entangled with other virtues. Chesterton's going to take this idea and show you how the modern virtues or the classical Christian virtues in the modern world have been separated and isolated from each other. So you'll have somebody who has a lot of love and they're trying to be loving to someone, but it's not connected. It's not entangled with necessarily truth. So you might find somebody who's extremely loving, but they're not willing to tell the person the truth. And they're sort of willing to accept whatever this person does uh, because they want to come across as loving. But you can't really separate true love from truth because the moment you leave truth out, you might not be as honest as you need to be with this person. Uh, and because these virtues have been separated, we have hearts, but we've got our hearts in the wrong place. So just relating back to that expression Chesterton mentions. So I'll just read that again to give you the context again. It says, and there is no more subtle truth than that of the everyday phrase about a man having his heart in the right place. It involves the normal, propor normal proportion, the idea of normal proportion. Not only does a certain function exist, but it is rightly related to other functions. So we mentioned how the virtues are connected, right? Indeed, the negation of this phrase would describe with peculiar accuracy the somewhat morbid mercy and perverse tenderness of the most representative moderns. So here he's basically just saying that denying this, denying that virtues, functions, in this case, the heart and having it in the right place, denying that things are related is a characteristic of what Chesterton calls the moderns. And he's going to flesh this idea out a little bit more soon. If, for instance, I had to describe with fairness the character of Mr. Bernard Shaw, who's a quite a famous author, I'm going to show you an image of him in a moment. And I'll give you a little bit of background about, about Mr. Shaw. But here Chesterton is basically going to, well, he's basically going to show you the opinion that he feels Mr. Bernard Shaw holds. So let's read it. Okay, so if, for instance, I had to describe with fairness the character of Mr. Bernard Shaw, I could not express myself more exactly than by saying he has a heroically large and generous heart, but not a heart in the right place. And this is so of the typical society of our time. So over here, I'll show you an image of Mr. Shaw so you can see him. And very famous writer. A lot of people are familiar with Shaw. I'm just going to read you. Uh, I, th I thought it would be a safe bet just to read you his Wikipedia <laughs> description. So take that with a grain of salt if you need to. But uh, it just says George Bernard Shaw was a playwright. Uh, he's known at his insistence simply as Bernard Shaw, even though his full name is George Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright, a critic, a polemicist, and a political activist. His influence on Western theater, culture, and politics extended from the 1880s to his death and beyond. Now, very important, Chesterton and Shaw were, were actually friends. Uh, they were contemporaries, they were common thinkers of their time, and they were good friends. They disagreed on a lot of things. I've actually got a photo here for you guys of the two of them together. Uh, let me quickly put that one up. So here you'll see Chesterton on the far right. On the far left, you'll see um, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> and in the middle, you'll see the always wonderful Hilaire Belloc uh, looking as cheerful as ever who is also a fantastic writer and very interesting guy. We will talk about him in a, few, in a future show. Uh, all three of them were friends. I'm actually not too sure if, if Belloc and Shaw were friends, but I do know Chesterton and Shaw were good friends despite their differences. And this is one of the beautiful things about Chesterton is he was really great at addressing his critics and disagreeing with his critics 
but in a truly loving way. Uh, he did not uh, degrade people. He loved to, in, to challenge ideas fiercely, but he always did it with love. So that's a great photo. I really like that photo of Sean Chesterton. And now let's jump back to the reading. And I'm basically just going to remove these. Okay, so just to gain some context again, Chesterton has mentioned that um, this idea that we have to have our hearts in the right place. So we not only have a sort of virtue in the case of love or honesty or pity or mercy, um, but that virtue actually relates to other virtues. It needs to be in the right place, which means it could also be in the wrong place. He then mentions his friend Shaw and how Shaw basically has a huge heart, but it's not in the right place. Okay, so he then says this is typical of people of the modern world. And then he says something very interesting. The modern world is not evil. In some ways, the modern world is far too good. It is full of wild and wasted virtues. When a religious scheme is shattered, as Christianity was shattered at the Reformation, it is not merely the vices that are let loose. The vices are indeed let loose and they wander and do damage. But the virtues are let loose also and the virtues wander more wildly and the virtues do more terrible damage. So here we come now to that first idea Chesterton's addressing, which everything's been leading up to, which is this. The modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. Now, at this point, it's very fair to ask, why have they gone mad? Because if I'm showing love to someone, surely that's a good thing. I mean, if I'm showing love to one person here and I'm showing a lot of love, I'm exercising virtue, aren't I? Um, why is that a bad thing? If somebody just has love, hey, at least they just have love. At least they have love. But why is it so important that the virtues need to be connected? Well, this is exactly what Chesterton addresses in the next line. He says, the modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. The virtues have gone mad because they have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone. So we've separated the virtue. Now Chesterton's going to give you a few examples of this. And he's basically just going to further elucidate this idea. The virtues have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone. Thus, some scientists care for truth and their truth is pitiless. Right. So the, the virtue of truth is not connected with the virtue of pity. Thus, some humanitarians only care for pity and their pity, I'm sorry to say, is often untruthful. There's a great example of how Chesterton is always very um, compassionate. He, he says uh, their pity and then he says in brackets, I'm sorry to say, I hate to say it, but this is just the case. I'm sorry to say is often untruthful. So you see, we've got like, we've got truth, we're searching for truth, but we've separated it from pity. So these virtues have been torn apart, right? Then he says, for example, Mr. Blatchford, and here Chesterton's talking about Robert Blatchford. Um, I'm going to show you a picture here of what he looks like. There you go on the screen. He was a contemporary of Chesterton and he's sometimes called Chesterton's socialist friend. I'll give you um, a little bit of a, a very short description of who he is just from a website. Robert Blatchford was an Englishman a friend and debating partner of G.K. Chesterton and an early enthusiast for socialism. Born in 1851, he was a generation older than Chesterton. So working at pretty much the same time. Um, both were thinking and writing at the same time. And so they obviously had a lot of differences. And um, this is who Chesterton is referring to now in this current chapter. So let's have a look at what Mr. Blatchford thinks. And remember, Chesterton has just pointed out that it's not that we don't have virtues. We have lots of virtues. We've just separated fr them from each other. We've denied, we, we say that there is a heart, but we deny that it needs to be in the right place. We say that there is no right or wrong place. What matters is the heart. And that's, that's the problem. Okay, so for example, Mr. Blatchford attacks Christianity because he is mad on one Christian virtue, the merely mystical and almost irrational virtue of charity. He, meaning Mr. Blatchford, 
has a strange idea that he will make it easier to forgive sins by saying that there are no sins to forgive. Mr. Blatchford is not only an early Christian, he is the only early Christian who ought really to have been eaten by lions. For in his case, the pagan accusation is really true. His mercy would mean mere anarchy. He really is the enemy of the human race because he is so human. As the other extreme, we may take the acrid realist who has deliberately killed in himself all human pleasure in happy tales or in the healing of the heart. You know, sometimes you'll speak to people and they'll say, I'm not pessimistic, I'm just realistic. And of course, in a way, they kind of they're kind of covering their pessimism with this with this idea that they're just being realistic. Now, it's good to be realistic, but you can be realistic about how terrible the situation is and yet still have hope and from that hope derive optimism. In fact, the more hopeless the situation, the more reason there is to have hope. And so therefore, the more reason there is to have optimism. So actually, and I'm just thinking about this now, if somebody is, if somebody says, I'm not pessimistic, I'm just realistic. Well, the whole point of optimism is that even though things realistically don't look good, we still maintain an optimistic point of view because our optimism is based not on something that comes and goes, the situation. It's based on something more permanent, i.e. hope, right? Okay, so let's jump back to what Chesterton is saying about Mr. Blatchford. Oh, sorry, now he's talking about the acrid realist. Mr. Blatchford was basically saying that, um, well, let's just forgive all the sins by saying that there are no sins to forgive. But this is actually more damaging to society. This is actually more damaging to people. Chesterton's going to highlight why a little bit later. But let's continue reading. Because he is so human, as the other extreme, we may take the acrid realist who has deliberately killed in himself all human pleasures in happy tales or in healing of the heart. Torquemada, who was a, I believe, a Dominican friar who was involved in the Spanish Inquisition. Torquemada, I hope I'm, I'm probably not saying that right, but... There you go. Torquemada tortured people physically for the sake of moral truth. Zola tortured people morally for the sake of physical truth. But in Torquemada's time, there was at least a system that could to some extent make righteousness and peace kiss each other. Right. So you're bringing, in some sense, peace and righteousness together. You're, you're uniting the virtues as opposed to what we're doing today, which is separating them from one another. Now, now they do not even bow. Okay, so he could get them together now to kiss. Now, these days, virtues don't even bow. They don't even really greet each other. That's how far away they are from one another. But a much stronger case than these two of truth and pity can be found in the remarkable case of the dislocation of humility. So Chesterton is showing you how the virtues are separated. Now he's going to focus in on one specific virtue, humility, being humble. And he's going to show you how we are actually too humble now. Um, we've separated humility to such a degree, we've dislocated it from its collection with all the other virtues that the modern world, again, our heart is so big, but it's in the wrong place. We're extremely humble, but in the wrong way. How are we like this? Well, let's have a look. And I quickly want to just check that the stream is still running. And oh my goodness, thank you so much, Keenan, for the super chat. Um, that's actually my first super chat ever. So that actually means a lot. Thank you so much. That's awesome. I appreciate that immensely. Um, you didn't ask a question or anything, but um, you don't you don't need to. I just appreciate the donation. Thank you so much. Okay, so hopefully you can all still hear me. It looks like everything's good. And welcome to all the wonderful viewers who are here. Okay, so we're going to focus in on humility now. How have we separated humility? How have we pulled this away from the other virtues? It's a really good question. Let's see what Chesterton thinks. It is only with one aspect of humility that we are here concerned. Humility was largely meant as a restraint upon arrogance and infinity of the appetite of man. Okay, so humility is meant to restrain two things. Number one, our, our arrogance, and then number two, our endless appetite, our infinity of appetite, our insatiable appetite. We always want more, right? You give someone more power, 
it's not long before they want more. You give someone more money, it's not long before they want more. You give an addict what he's craving, it's not long before he wants more, right? It's never enough. So humility is meant to be a bulwark. It's meant to, it's meant to prevent us from going too far. Ah, but notice this. He was always outstripping his mercies with his own newly invented needs. His very power of enjoyment, he's just speaking about general uh, mankind now, his very power of enjoyment destroyed half his joys. By asking for pleasure, he lost the chief pleasure, for the chief pleasure is surprise. Hence it became evident that if a man would make his world large, he must always be making himself small. Right, The smaller we make ourselves, the larger the world becomes, because we realize how small we are in it. Right. So humility actually makes the world a bigger place, uh, a more, you could say, a place filled with more wonder, because at the root of humility, you're actually admitting that you don't really know everything, that there's a lot of life that's a complete mystery. And that's actually healthy, which is what Chesterton really argues in the previous chapter. The man who is completely convinced and knows exactly what he thinks is often the person who ends up in the madhouse. Because it's not that he's lost his reason, it's that he's lost everything except his reason. He's only got reason left. Whereas we need imagination, we need wonder, we need curiosity, we need the humility to admit we don't really know everything. Okay, so let's have a look now back where we were. Sorry, I keep going on tangents, but that's kind of part of the show. (laughs) Okay, so by asking for pleasure, he lost the chief pleasure, for the chief pleasure is surprise. Hence, it became evident that if a man would make his world large, he must be always making himself small. Even the haughty visions, the tall cities and the toppling pinnacles are the creations of humility. The tall towers are the creation of humility. What? Why? Giants that tread down forests like grass are the creations of humility. What? Why? Well, here's the answer. Towers that vanish upwards above the loneliest star are the creations of humility, for towers are not tall unless we look up at them. So by creating this large tower, it's almost like a, an inherent reminder of our tininess, right? And giants are not giants unless they are larger than we. All this giantesque imagination, our ability to imagine, um, our ability to imagine these giant skyscrapers that we're going to build, our ability to imagine in our mythologies giants, things that are larger than ourselves. Um, This is such an interesting point. All this giantesque imagination, which is perhaps the mightiest of the pleasures of man, is at bottom entirely humble because it always reminds us of how small we are. And then Chesterton drops, drops this paragraph with a beautiful point. He says, it is impossible without humility to enjoy anything, even pride. We can't even enjoy pride without humility because we have to admit that we lacked something and we somehow ascended, we somehow went up. And to, do, to say that I've gotten to a point where I can be proud assumes you came from a place where you were small. So in, in, humility is wrapped up in pride and you can't really even enjoy pride without having some humility. Which is, which is such a great point. And what Chesterton is doing here is he's basically hammering home how key, how, how fundamental humility is. You know, humility is a funny thing because it's a lot like respect. If you demand respect, you lose it. If you try to force someone to respect you, they respect you less. Humility is similar. If I walk around saying, oh, I'm so humble, I'm the most humble person you're ever going to meet. The more I brag about being humble, the less humble I am. The more I force respect, the less respect I get. So Chesedon is trying to show you here that even if you're prideful, you need humility to enjoy that pride, which is such a deep insight. So I think in a way he's trying to appeal to everybody And before he goes on to the next point, he's just trying to show you we need humility. In fact, humility is reflected in our skyscrapers. We experience it when we're at the bottom of, uh, you know, when we're down in a valley and we're looking up to the peak, we realize how small we are. Humility is just a part of life. Chesterton is not prescribing what reality should be like. He's describing what it is like. Okay, so then the next part of this is, 
But what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Remember that earlier line, uh, we have our hearts in the right place? Okay, well, we have our hearts in the wrong place. We've got plenty of heart, but it's in the wrong place. In the same way, we have plenty of humility, but the humility is in the wrong place. How so? Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction. We're no longer modest about what we could achieve. We are now modest about what we have achieved. Now, if that doesn't make total sense, don't worry. I'm going to flesh it out in this next chapter, chapter, uh, in this next section, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. Let's just jump back and break that down a little bit. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. So, you know, if I say I'm certain that there is no absolute truth, that means I don't doubt myself at all. I'm actually asserting myself completely. What Chesterton is saying here is that true humility is actually saying, you know, I kind of doubt myself. I'm pretty sure that the truth is the truth, regardless of what I think. I might be wrong, and I'm trying to get closer to what the actual truth is. I'm trying to discover what the ideal is for my life, for my family, for my community. I might sound like Jordan Peterson now, but you get the point. Humility is there to help us doubt ourselves, but this has been reversed. What do we do now? We doubt the truth itself and we assert ourselves. We say, I am correct. The truth, it needs to count out to me, right? This is what Chesterton means when he says, modesty has moved from the organ of ambition and it's now settled on the organ of conviction. So we're no longer modest about our ambitions, what there could be, what I could become, what I could discover, what I don't know. Now we're modest about our convictions. I know this is the case. Um, but I'm, I'm modest about it. I, I don't know if there could be a truth. There might not be a truth. I don't know. We're so modest that we won't even admit that there is perhaps a truth to be known. Our, our humility is taken to the utmost extreme to the point where we, 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 have, we have so much humility that we end up not having it. And that's a little paradoxical, but I'll break it down more as we go. Okay, good. So a man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt. The divine reason. Truth. Okay, so I just want to say... Thanks so much for the comments, everybody. Uh, Peggy, I see your message. I hope you plan to do more of these good stuff. Thank you, Peggy. I'm definitely going to do more of these. I'm probably going to do the whole book. It does take a lot of prep work, so it does take a little bit of time. But if you haven't already, I've done chapter one and I've done chapter two. Chapter one is much more of a reading. Chapter two is a little bit more commentary and reading. This one is the direction I'm going to go with all of them. Because I think you can just buy the book and read it yourself, right? So what I want to give you is the book, but I also want to try and really break it down for you. Because when I'm reading this, I the first time I read Chesterton, I'm, a lot of it goes over my head. So I need to sit and really try and understand what he's saying. So I search for examples. I search for... Um, I search for more context about what he's saying. Like I like to go and look into who's actually, who's he referring to. And in that process, I end up with, with just a lot of background knowledge about the chapter. And that's actually what I want to give to you guys, because I think that that's something of value, right? It's not something that you'll necessarily get if you just read it once. So hopefully if you're enjoying this, you will go further and perhaps read the book yourself if, if it really grabs you because orthodoxy is incredible. I really recommend it. Okay, and then I just want to jump to another comment. Thank you so much, Professor Freak. I love reading the names. Awesome 100. Awesome. Thank you for your comment. Uh, and then 
I don't really know how to pronounce this name, H-N-S-H-N, Hunshin. A lot of his arguments start off sounding like paradoxical statement, but he explains them very thor thoroughly. Thanks for representing his work. Okay, awesome. Chesedon needs to be represented, people. Uh, Chesedon should be taught in schools, but he isn't. It's sad. Chesedon was a genius. He might be one of the greatest minds. I think he was one of the greatest minds um, in the last 500 years, but... You don't have to take my word for it. Just read some of his books. You'll see what I mean. So I'm I'm really glad that people are enjoying Chesterton because he needs to be shared. Okay, so let's let's jump back to let's jump back to the book. So Huxley, and here he's talking about Aldous Huxley, preached a humility content to learn from nature. But the new skeptic is so humble that he doubts if he can even learn. So remember, humility, we've got too much of it. It's not in the right place. We doubt if we can even learn. Thus, we should be wrong if we had said hastily that there is no humility typical of our time. The truth is that there is a real humility typical of our time, but it so happens that it is practically a more poisonous humility than the wild prostrations of the ascetic. So we've got humility, but it's not exactly a healthy humility. How so? Well, the old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. Okay, so he's going to he's going to flesh this out now. He says, "For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, about himself. Am I achieving what I could be? Am I really pursuing the truth? I need to humble myself and reorient my direction, right? That's the old humility. Now he details the new humility, but the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, about his goal, about the ideal, about the truth that he's pursuing. Now it's not about Oh, oh I, I need to humble myself. Maybe I'm going wrong. No, 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 no. Now it's, oh, the ideal is wrong. Um, the, 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 the ideals that have come down from my ancestors, from my traditions, that thing is wrong. I need to define my own understanding of, of uh, what my aim is going to be. And as a consequence, this makes us stop working altogether, says Chesterton, because if you have no aim or if your aim is always changing, once you get to your aim, it's already changed to something else. So you never truly progress because real progression, right? Progressing towards something means that there's something solid towards which we progress. But if the, if the ideal, if the thing that we're, we're, we're chasing, if every time we get there, we just define a new ideal because the ideal is not concrete, the ideal is not founded in anything unchanging, every time we just change it, we never really get anywhere. We're just progressing to a point where we feel, okay, now we need to progress towards something else. Okay, so we need humility, but we want to have it in the right place. And here Chesterton just... He hits you with some wonderful, wonderful lines. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that a lot because everything he writes is so good. I'm a total fanboy for Chesterton. I'm not ashamed. Okay, so at any street corner, we may, we may meet a man who utters the frantic and blasphemous statement that he may be wrong. Every day, one comes across somebody who says that, of course, his view may not be the right one. So, you know, when you hear people say, this is my opinion, I might be wrong, but this is just my opinion. Chesterton thinks that's a bad modern habit. If it's your opinion, you shouldn't think it's wrong. If, it, if you think it's wrong or you think it might be wrong, then don't say it's your opinion. Say this is an opinion. This is an opinion that people hold. I'm considering it. But if you say, this is my opinion, you should actually say, this is my opinion, and I, it's my opinion because I believe it's correct, not because I think it might be wrong, right? Now, that's a healthy humility, right? So you might be wrong, and if somebody can give you reasons why you're wrong, you're going to listen, and you're going to consider, and you're going to possibly accept those reasons. But to say, this is my opinion, and I might be wrong, it's... It's like you're holding views and you don't even believe them. And you're trying to convince other people that they should believe them. So I notice this in myself, right? I notice that sometimes I'll say, this is my opinion. Look, I could be wrong. Now, of course, the reality is I might be wrong. But 
I say rather, this is my opinion and I'm convinced of it right now. So I believe this is correct. I think that's 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 what Chesterton's gonna really focus in on over here. So he says, at any street corner, we may meet a man who utters the frantic and blasphemous statement that he may be wrong. Every day one comes across somebody who says that of course his view may not be the right one. And then Chesterton says, of course his view must be the right one or it is not his view. We are on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. Well, I don't know if we can really believe in numbers. You know, everything just divulges and melts into this kind of relativism where you have no absolute truths. You don't even have the absolute truth of um, basic, basic, basic things. Okay, so let's have a look. Of course, this view must be the right one, or is it not his view? We are on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. We are in danger of seeing philosophers who doubt the law of gravity as being a mere fancy of their own. Oh, I, I happen to believe in gravity because it appeals to me, but if you don't believe in it, that's okay. Scoffers of all time were too proud to be convinced but these are too humble to be convinced. And here he just sums it all up so beautifully. He says, the meek do inherit the earth, but the modern skeptics are too meek even to claim their inheritance. We're so humble that we're almost too meek. We can't even claim the world because, you know, we can't even inherit the world as meek because we're so meek. We don't even want the inheritance, right? Oh my goodness, that's genius. It is exactly this intellectual helplessness, which is our second problem. Okay, so now Chesterton kind of switches gears and he explores, he explores another area of this idea. We're just going to read through it, then we'll reflect a little bit as we have been doing. But um, I see it's already been f about 40 minutes since we started, so we are definitely not going to get through this whole chapter in this in this session but what I'll do is I'll just label it part one and then uh, very soon I'll, I'll have a part two you guys can let me know if you'd like that if you've enjoyed this so far um, and if you have any questions just drop them in, ch in the chat and I'll respond probably at the end of the stream which is not far from now I think we're gonna go a little bit longer um, but I mean look let me just convey this to you we've only read <laughs> like two pages and the amount of genius compacted into those two pages already is just staggering. Okay, so there's so much more we could explore, but let's continue for now. So now Chesterton kind of reflects on the last chapter, and he just reminds you of what he was saying in the previous chapter, and it's this. The last chapter has been concerned only with a fact of observation, that what peril of mor morbidity there is for a man comes rather from his reason than his imagination. A simple way to say that would just be that our problems come not from our imagination. Our problems come from our reason. Um, a worship of reason leads actually to a loss of reason, which Chesterton will explain. It was not meant to attack the authority of reason. His previous chapter, he's not attacking the authority of reason. Rather, it's the opposite. Rather, it is the ultimate purpose to defend it. For it needs defense. Reason needs defense. The whole modern world is at war with reason, and the tower already reels. Okay, so how are we at war with reason? Good question. Let's explore. Let's see what Chesterton says. The sages, it is often said, can see no answer to the riddle of religion. But the trouble with our sages is not that they cannot see the answer. It is that they cannot even see the riddle. They are like, oh, Chesterton gets a bit rough here. Um, <laughs> you don't often hear him read, I haven't read, seen him speak like this much. They are like children so stupid as to notice nothing paradoxical in the playful assertion that a door is not a door. The modern latitudinarians speak, for instance, about authority in religion, not only as if there were no reason in it, but as if there had never been any reason for it. We talk about religion in the modern world like... There's no reason for it uh, to emerge. It, it, it's it's just a an infantile wish. It's just a mistake. It's just a accident. It's just a coping mechanism. The modern 
world doesn't think that there could be such a thing as reason embedded within a religious person's frame of view. They see religion as a kind of archaic, outdated, um, old piece of system software that people still have to uninstall, right? That's how they view it. So Chesterton mentions, apart from seeing its philosophical basis, they cannot even see its historical cause. Religious authority has often, doubtless, been oppressive or unreasonable, just as every legal system, and especially our present one, has been callous and full of cruel apathy. So now Chesterton's going to take us into the, the topic of authority and how how authority is actually meant to regulate our tendency to, we mentioned a little bit earlier, our arrogance and our just insatiable appetite, why authority is a necessary thing. But he begins by saying that, yes, religious authority is a thing, and it has done bad things. It has messed up, right? Chesterton openly admits this. I'll read it again just so you can see. Religious authority has often doubtless been oppressive or unreasonable. But then Chesterton sort of peppers it by saying, just like every legal system that there has been and has been callous and full of cruel apathy. It is rational to attack the police, nay, it is glorious. But the modern critics of religious authority are like men who should attack the police without ever having heard of burglars. It's like, okay, yes. Um, if you think of the the religious authority kind of like the police, making making sure things are, are working, it's one thing to criticize them for when they do things wrong like so you know the police are meant to protect but now police are injuring people you can you can criticize that but Chesterton is saying we criticize religious authority as if they were police okay so imagine they're police we criticize the police and as if there was never such a thing as burglars so in this way religious authority is not just some random occurrence it's there as a bulwark as a defense for something. It's it's meant to prevent something from happening. So if you think about the police analogy, it's like the police are there to prevent the, the criminals. That's why it's there. But the moderns are kind of criticizing the police and they're not even thinking about the fact that the police were already originally there to prevent to prevent uh you know burglars. In the same way religious authority is not just it didn't just jump out of thin air. I mean it okay well I guess maybe in a way uh, we'll talk about that later. So it didn't just appear uh, as an accident. It's it's meant to deter something. Okay, so let's explore why. But the modern critics of religious authority are like men who should attack the police without ever having heard of burglars. For there is a great and possible peril to the human mind, a peril as practical as burglary. So what is this great peril? Against it, religious authority was reared, rightly or wrongly, as a barrier. Sometimes wrongly, sometimes unfairly, sometimes unjustly, right? Religious authority has made mistakes. But also think about what religious authority is trying to defend. Let's have a look. And against it, something certainly must be reared as a barrier if we are to avoid ruin. Okay, so what is this thing that religious authority is trying to prevent us from, from falling into? Okay, really good question. That peril is that the human intellect is free to destroy itself. The human intellect is free to destroy itself. Our own minds can destroy us. What does this mean? Let's get practical. And Chesterton gives a few really practical ideas here. He says, just as one generation could prevent the very existence of the next generation by all entering a monastery or jumping into the sea, so one set of thinkers can in some degree prevent further thinking by teaching the next generation that there is no validity in any human thought. It is idle to talk always of the alternative of reason and faith. Reason is itself a matter of faith. It is an act of faith to assert that our thoughts have any relation to reality at all. Okay, so there's a lot there. Let's just explore that a little bit. Our intellect can destroy itself. And it's actually a crazy thing to think about that one generation could actually stop and end humanity if everybody just decided we weren't going to have kids anymore. If everybody just decided to jump into the ocean, 
that one generation's decisions could end all future decisions for all future generations because they'd never get the opportunity to, to, take, to make the decisions. So in the same way, he's relating that to thought, you might have a set of thinkers of thought, thought leaders in one generation who are spreading ideas, cultural ideas, memes within culture. And those, those ideas may prevent further generations from even thinking by convincing them that the very act of thinking is not worth it, that there's no value in thought at all. Okay, so Chesterton's going to flesh this out. And then I love this line. He just says, it is idle. It's, it's just, it's, it's not worth our time talking about the, uh, talking of the alter alternative of reason and faith. He's saying reason isn't necessary, necessarily an alternative to faith. It's, it's an act of faith itself because it takes faith to assume that your thoughts have any relationship, any relation to reality at all. That the thoughts you have about the world are related to the world as you experience it is a matter of faith. Okay, so that's, man, we could talk, we could have a whole stream on just that line. If you are merely a skeptic, you must sooner or later ask yourself this question. Why should anything go right? Even observation and deduction. Why should not good logic be as misleading as bad logic? Why is logic, um, why do we assume that good logic is better than bad logic, right? Why is it that when I go out into the world and I explore the world, I explore creation, I explore the universe, I assume that there's some sort of an order within it that allows me to explore it, right? I assume that the world operates on principles, that if a seed leads to a tree, the next seed is going to lead to the same tree. Why are, why is there that order within it? When I speak to someone and I use language, if I just suddenly start switching up the words and start saying random sounds, I've robbed the order and the reason and the meaning and the logic from the language I'm speaking and the other person is not going to be able to understand me. Why is it that we need to impart meaning upon things? Why, why is meaning itself a thing? Okay, so we're getting a little bit um, deeper into this now. And then Chesterton says, and he's, he's basically, he's, he's asking this question, why should anything go right? Even observation and deduction. Why should not good logic be as misleading as bad logic? They are both movements in the brain of a bewildered ape. The young skeptic says, I have a right to think for myself. But the old skeptic, the complete skeptic, the skeptic that's gotten to the end of the thought, what do they say? They say, I have no right to think for myself because I have no right to think at all. Okay, because if you're fully skeptical, you're going to have to be skeptical even about thoughts themselves. How can I even have thoughts? Because I need to be skeptical of those to begin with, right? So the path this line of thinking takes you down is a problem. Because reason is itself a form of authority. Just like religious authority, we need the authority of reason, but we're attacking authority. So even the authority of reason will one day disappear if we keep going down the same route. And in many ways it has. The authority of reason will go away and you'll end up in situations where people are saying, well, I, I, if I have to be completely skeptical, I have, to, I have to doubt even thought itself that I can even think. Okay, so then Chesterton sums us up by saying, there is a thought that stops thought. This is the only thought that ought to be stopped. That's so brilliant. I'll read it again. There is a thought that stops thought. That is the only thought that ought to be stopped. And we just sort of went through it, right? It's this idea that I have no right to think at all. I'm so ultimately skeptical that I can't even think. And Chesterton's saying, no, this is the one thought we actually need to stop. And what stops it? Well, let's have a read. That is the ultimate evil against which all religious authority was aimed. Okay, so we don't really think about it that way. But notice here, he says, it only appears at the end of decadent ages like our own. And already Mr. H.G. Wells, who was also a friend of Chesterton, has raised its ruinous banner. He has written a delicate piece of skepticism called Doubts of the Instrument. 
In this, he questions the brain itself and endeavors to remove all reality from all his own assertions, past, present, and to come. But it was against this remote ruin that all the military systems in religion were originally ranked and ruled. The creeds and the crusades, the hierarchies and the horrible persecutions were not organized, as is ignorantly said, for the suppression of reason. They were organized for the difficult defense of reason. Manned by a blind man by a blind instinct knew that if one's things were wildly questioned, reason would be questioned first. Reason would be the first, one of the first things we begin to doubt. If I'm doubting my thoughts, why should I doubt reason at all? And you end up in a situation where you've completely abandoned reason totally, where you've ended up with just reason, and then because you've just ended up with reason, you actually reason yourself out of reason and you're left with nothing. And what Chesterton spends the rest of this chapter doing is fleshing out the consequences of this, of what actually ends up happening. Okay, so that's such a beautiful line, hey? He says, They were organized for the difficult defense of reason, because man by a blind instinct knew that if once things were wildly questioned, reason could be questioned first. The authority of priests to absolve, the authority of popes to define the authority, even of inquisitors to terrify, these were all only dark defenses ere erected round one central authority, more undemonstrable, more supernatural than all, the authority of a man to think. Once you eliminate that authority, all of these things, right, that Chesterton's describing, like the, the different authority of the priests, the authority of the popes, even the way that the inquisitors would terrify people. And Chesterton admits that these are dark defenses, right? The, the ability for inquisitors to terrify people isn't, isn't a good thing. But what it's trying to do is it's trying to protect one central authority. It's actually trying to protect reason. And it's basically protecting the sole authority, which is that we have the authority to think itself. That we, we, we don't necessarily need to doubt our thought. Now, you might have to doubt specific thoughts, but thought itself shouldn't be something that we abandon. It's crazy that we even have to think that, right? We even have to say that. We know now that this is so. We have no excuse for not knowing it. For we can hear skepticism crashing through the old ring of authorities. And at the same moment, we can see reason swaying upon her throne. In so far as religion is gone, reason is going, for they are both of the same primary and authoritative kind. They are both methods of proof which cannot themselves be proved. Reason can't itself be proved, and you end up with a skepticism where people actually abandon it, right? And in the act of destroying the idea of divine authority, we have largely de destroyed the idea of that human authority by which we do a long division sum. With a long and sustained tug, we have attempted to pull the mitre off pontifical man, and his head has come off with it. Lest this should be called a loose assertion, it is perhaps desirable, though dull, to run rapidly through the chief modern fashions of thought which have this effect of stopping thought itself. So Chesterton basically now tells you, okay, let's, let's systematically go through each of the modern, the modern sort of fashions, intellectual fashions, which have this, this quality of the thought that we want to stop, which is basically the thought that we should stop thinking entirely. Okay, so let's see. I think we might actually stop there for now uh, because it has been just about an hour. I'm going to have a quick look if any questions have come through. Overall, it looks like we haven't, but it looks like we had a few people here. Really nice to have you all here. I appreciate your time. I'm actually going to end this one for today, and we're going to continue very, very soon. Um, I want to come to this even more prepared next time to give you more elaborate ideas. I think I'll... I'll do the part two, but I'll probably also revise some of the things I said in part one. Because like I said, I'm also still uh, 
trying to fully understand the thoughts. But I'm sure you can already see how deep the thoughts are, right? Um, Chesterton does like to give examples, and he is going to do that as we continue. But for now, I think this is a good place to stop things because it's about an hour. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. This has been Existential Delight. My name is Dylan. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please consider giving this video a like, leaving a comment. It actually does help. And um, yeah, also there's a bunch of links in the description you can follow, um, different ways to support the channel. I work a full-time job and this is something that I do on the side just because I love it and I'm interested in it. And I think Chesterton is worth sharing. Uh, even if we don't fully understand his ideas, I think we can all see the value in his ideas. So if you have any feedback for me, you can just drop it in the chat and I really appreciate that. And I'm wishing you all a wonderful day wherever you are. Um, wonderful night, wonderful day. It's night here by me here in South Africa. So I hope you're having a good day. And just thank you so much for your time. And I'll see you in a future stream. And uh, God bless. Goodbye for now.